Hello, my name is Nancy. I'm with the Kingston Handloom Weavers and Spinners Guild here in Kingston. We have a studio on the second floor of the Tut Center, and we've been an active guild in Kingston since 1948. Uh, together with our 85 members, if you look in our studio, you will see a whole range of equipment for learning to spin, weave, felt, dye. There's an extensive library, and most importantly, you will see people most often working together to create beautiful things. To share with you today, we've decided to offer a small project as a simple weaving project but it certainly does, ha does not have any limitations. And once you consider some of these basic skills, you can extend, explore, and go on your own. There are some examples of other weaving that we do on, on the looms. There's tea towels, scarves, things to wear, things to use in your home on a daily basis. Color is a big part of what we do, so, um, and also using natural fibers. Um, I'm more of a spinner, so I'm very pleased to have a number of fiber producers within our Kingston area and access to good fiber to spin. I'm going to be using a combination of uh, hand spun fiber as well as commercial yarns. It, these materials that you need, you will easily find in your own home. We chose to offer uh, make, weaving a small mat. A small mat can have many reasons. So here are some samples that we have woven. Um, the, red, the red mat, good for your favorite pottery mug and your hot beverage keeps it off the table. Uh, another small mat uh, to pick up the colors of a specialty uh, decorative item. There are mats that don't need to be very wide. This one started out to be, it could be a bracelet, it could be a bookmark. I'm opting to actually add jingle bells to it and uh, it's going to be a doorknob decoration. Then there are mats that just much prefer to be hung up. They can hang on the wall, they can hang in a window, but they're all made in the same way that I'm going to show you today. So let's get started. Um, first we need to build the small portable loom and I find that I start looking at everything in my house with a very different view. As packaging comes in, I'm looking and say, setting aside pieces of cardboard you want something that is very firm, um, not easily bent, and very smooth. So I often will just put it aside, not sure what I want to use it for. It can be any size. This little loom has been used many, many, many times by beginning weavers, and it's still good. So you put the time into actually cutting and building it, measuring it, and it can last for many different projects. So the one I'll, I will just show you quickly, I've tried to uh, create the process in such a way that you can see the steps that I take. This is a piece that interested me, but I realized that with the, the cutouts, I was not going to be able to use it in a vertical position, but it does interest me to use it more like this. It could become a placemat, it could become one side of a uh, a bag, I need a new cover for my tablet, so that might be the perfect size for that. So, once you've found your cardboard, the base for your loom, you're also going to need a ruler, a good ruler that is longer than the piece of the cardboard so that you can easily and clearly measure. Measurements are easy to read, I need a pencil and a pair of scissors. That's what I need to get started. So I have, first of all, taken the cardboard and because of the, the cutout part, I've measured off and drawn a line so that I know that's the outside boundary of my loom. I then measured on both sides, about mm, a quarter, a three eighths of an inch down to make a line so that as I make the cuts for the slits, they will be of a consistent depth. I've done the same thing on the other side of the loom, drawn that line so that I know how far down I can cut. I've also, just for my own thinking, marked the center of the loom. I'm not sure if that will be important to me later on, 
but it's nice to know where that center line is. So again, I'm using my, my ruler, and whether you use metric or imperial measurements, doesn't matter, but be consistent. Um, so I believe I have chosen to use imperial, and I have measured off and drawn, let me just get back to my spot here, drawn some lines along at every quarter inch, all the way to what I term to be the edge. The outside edge of my loom. And then going to use my ruler crosswise and make sure that they line up straight with the uh, marks on the other side of the loom. And I'm just going to make sure that I'm marking my cut lines carefully and clearly. Some people are comfortable using a box cutter or a, a cutting knife. I prefer to use scissors, but that's just a preference. Okay. It is important that the two slits are going to line up across because once you warp the loom, most often we like our warps the warp threads to be parallel to one another. But we're good. Okay. Now I'm just going to take my scissors, and they're fairly strong. I will cut carefully so that I don't go beyond that guiding line and make the slits. Okay, so the concept of weaving is that there are a set of fibers or yarns going in one direction. They're known as the warp. And here on the loom, table loom, you can see those warp line, warp threads that are carrying straight back. As I said, they are most often parallel, but not always if you want to do some really special kind of weaving. So we're going to need to put the warp thread on here. For a warp thread, you're looking for something that's very strong. Um, so if you, if you pull on it and it breaks, it's not likely something that you want to be using for your work. There's no point in spending your time getting this ready and then finding that you have to uh, start over again because something has broken. I'm going to do a, a small weaving just to get started and show you how this can work uh, so that I can take it through from beginning to end. So I take... Um, the end and I make a bit of a slip knot so that I can tie it over the end and as I said I'm not going to do the full width so I'm going to start here I think and I'm going to stretch it straight across to the other side. Make sure that I'm going into the same one. So I'm just going to count over two, six, and that's what I did from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now I'm just going to go behind and back out to the front. Then straight across to the slit on the far side behind. Those slits are a good depth so they will hold that work thread for me quite steadily. Back up to the top, around behind, across, around behind. I will maybe just slow down a little bit because if it's new it seems like what is she doing? So I'm just going in behind. I hold it with my thumb so that it is under tension, staying taut while I get it through that loop to back around to the front. I'm going to go straight across the loom over to the next slot. Through that slot, it's holding it for me so that I can look behind, hold it with my finger, 
and slide it into the next slot. And I'm going to tie these two together just so that they hold for me. Some people will put a piece of tape just to hold it until you're finished the weaving. I'll just put um, a knot that we can deal with later. So, step one, we have a simple loom, board loom. One more thing that um, you may have noticed on the small one is it is helpful to have these um, supports just underneath at either end. These ones have been glued in. You don't need to necessarily glue them in. You can just, as long as your support is wider than your actual warp that you're going to use, you can lift it and um, just slide it underneath all of them. One at the bottom of the loom. And the purpose of these is that it holds your warp threads up just a little bit so that as you are doing the weaving, it is a little bit easier to capture them. And there we have it. Those are the warp threads. If I run my hand across them, you can actually probably hear that they are nice and taut. There's no uh, springy part or soft part for it there. So now we're going to need some tools um, to do the weaving. And again, I start looking at everything in my house with a different view. Um, I'm going to need something to be able to take the weft over and over, over and under and over and under. And certainly uh, one of the easiest ways to do is with my fingers. Sometimes I prefer to have something else. Um, so I will use um, darning needles. Uh, sometimes they come as plastic needles, which are good to use for some folks. Um, I have other uh, tools around my house. Sometimes uh, uh, a skewer can be very handy. Um, popsicle sticks, if you have one. I didn't happen to, mine are pretty wide. That's uh, a bit much to be trying to do over and under, but if that is what works for you, um, this would equate to a shuttle that you would use if you were using a, a more formal, traditional type of loom. Um, for young folks, you can actually tape the um, tape the warp, sorry, the weft thread onto it, and I'll show you that in just a minute because we do think about people of different ages making some of these. Maybe people working together. If it's your very first experience, it can feel a bit awkward. I'm also going to need something to push the weft threads down. And so most often I use a fork. Um, I'll show you how that works. But you can also, if you have something like this around your house um, or this, I find them to be just great. Um, with the traditional loom, you have something built in as a beater that does that for you as you move it. So I mentioned these are the warp threads. We now need the threads that are going to go over and under and form the pattern or the coloring. They are known as the weft threads. If I'm thinking about making something that is going to be hanging, I probably do want to think about where it has been knotted, that I will keep those knots at the bottom of my weaving and consider this to be the top of my weaving. I usually start weaving at the bottom and weave up towards the top. So that's oh, I did have a piece. Um, that's what I will do now. I just need to think about um, some colors to use with this one, and I see it does not have uh, a warp stick in behind. So I'm going to add one just to help in manipulating those weft threads and I will put one in up at the other end as well. I'm going to think about using some of these materials, some of these colors. Um, and as I said, this is the bottom, so I'm going to think about this as the bottom. I'm going to measure off, if I use this whole length, that's going to get very tangled, so I'm just going to measure off what I think I can manage. Um, 
when you're weaving with a, a traditional loom, you're able to wind the bobbins and you get many, many yards on the bobbins in the shuttle before you, you need to change them. I think this will probably be enough. And I'm going to use If you get really interested in this style of hand weaving, there are certainly tools. Uh, there are wooden looms, or you can make a loom from a, a picture frame or a window frame. And you will find tools like this, where it's basically a very shaped stick. It does have a hole in the end, so I can attach the fiber and it will help carry it for me a little more easily. So, um, remembering that I'm thinking that this is the bottom of my loom, the bottom of my piece of weaving, and I'm going to weave. I'm going to start under and go, and just use my stick to go under and over. pull it through, but I'm going to leave, for this first part, I'm going to leave a long tail because I'm going to do something else with it in just a minute. Um, we'll keep a short fringe on this one at the bottom. So I'm just going to set that firm in place. Now, what's different from the last example that I did, I still have thread and I'm going to go back along the same way and when I go back I need to make sure that it came out over the warp thread so when I go back it needs to go under that first warp thread and then I can just follow that pattern of under and over and I get to the other side and I'm going to hold that just as I pull it through. One of the reasons that I left this long piece at the beginning is I want to be sure that I am going to secure this so that when I take it off the loom, it doesn't start to unravel. Um, I'm going to thread a darning needle. If you're comfortable with uh, crocheting, you might crochet across with this. If you're comfortable with hem stitching, if you're familiar with hem stitching, you can do that. I'm going to just simply um, make sure that I'm going around the warp threads and up in. I'm going to catch it so that it makes a knot around that area. And then I will move on to the next one and go around the warp and up in just one row. more to play with. Okay, so I'm going around, up in, and as I slide it out, it will make a knot and anchor that end of the weaving. There are many different ways to do uh, techniques in the fiber world. You may have other people that show you in different ways. Try them, learn from other people, and then follow what works best for you and your idea of what you're trying to create. Again, I'm just doing this so that when I take it off the loom, the bottom, the, uh, the woven thread, the woven weft threads will um, be secured and won't start to slide down. After the final one, I will just make sure that I can take this end and just treat it as if it were a weft going over and under, back a few ways. Whoops, not being cooperative today. I can also do it at the end when I take it off, and I'm going to choose to do that. But 
I'm just going to weave it back in and leave the edge. Okay, I think we probably need to just push these down again so that they are secure. So I had some other uh, choices here. I'm thinking about this, this piece. Um, I can continue with the green. I think I might start getting something ready uh, with the blue. I can use more than one color. I think we have some examples where either as a stripe or where you have alternated. It mixes the colors. You can hold two strands together. If I wanted to create um, a color that um, was more suggestive of, say, the sky, I would perhaps hold blue and white and a little bit of gray together. So really, as you're weaving, those are the choices that you can make. Um, I'm giving you some suggestions and options today. Um, really, the best way is to try it out. Don't be afraid to explore and um, see what you can come up with. And it's very easy, if you're not happy with it, it's very easy to take it out. <laughs> And start over again. Okay, oh, I didn't cut much of that. All right, so if I want to add a new color, I am going to, uh, I will start at the edge and where the green one came out over, I want to make sure that the new color is going to go under and I will follow that same pattern back across as if, oops. Regardless of what color I'm using, this is the sequence that needs to happen so that it locks those weft fibers into place. When I pull it through, I'm going to make sure I leave myself an end. And when I come back, it's going to come back in the opposite direction. So it came out over the last warp thread. It needs to go start under. And I'm going to pull it through. I think I am now going to change colors. So I'm going to go just over that one and do the opposite pattern. Not really looking to make stripes with these two, just trying to maybe suggest um, something in nature that I might see. Um, perhaps grasses by the edge of a pond. Um, so the colors, they don't come in discrete stripes. In nature, they tend to be more blended together. A lot of my inspiration comes from nature, the way the colors at different times of the year are, present themselves. Okay, again, I've left myself a little bit of a hill so that I can push it down. I don't need to take that green one back. I can now move on with the blue one and you'll start to see how um, it is starting to blend together. These yarns are both hand spun, um, probably as part of a demonstration in our guild we often do community demonstrations and one of the ones that we most often do is the sheepdog trials at Grass Creek Park which um, we demonstrate taking fleece off the sheep and spinning it and making it into things. Sometimes we dye it, sometimes we just use it as plain as, as the natural fibres. Sheep and alpaca present us with many different shades of natural colors, which are really quite lovely. All right, and I think I'm gonna alternate and take the green one back. I wanna make sure that this last one is going to get um, captured on the edge so that I don't have a, a loopy edge. I'm thinking this is probably not going to be a coaster, but it might be. Okay, 
I'm going to leave these longer threads. I do need to go back at the end and weave them in so that they're not just hanging loose, but I want to keep going with um, an idea that has come to mind. <clears throat> As I said, it reminded me a little bit of the edge of the water. Just going to introduce an idea that so far I have been weaving straight and, and um, making sure that I push all of the weft threads down in a similar line, but we can start to make some shapes. Heading back the other way. Um. So as I said, I don't always have to keep it flat. I'm going to start making some more textured threads. And I'll show you how I did that. I realize I went quickly. decide where I want some of that texture to be and I just lift and twist slightly so that it is not exactly smooth and then when I and then when I push down with the comb it makes more of a a bit of a swirl if I had more time I might or I might like to leave it sit overnight uh, and see if I still uh, want to add anything more. But for purposes of today, I'm going to cut it off and I'm going to leave, again, a fairly long tail. I may leave those on the sides, I'm not sure. Okay, it's handy to have either a dowel or a knitting needle when I'm thinking of taking this off. I'm going to make sure, it's going to hang, so I want to make sure that I don't lose um, any of the, the um, threads at the top. They are just hooked on the back and so I'm going to take my knitting needle and go through as if I were weaving, but it's not. But it is going to hold those threads for me so that when I take it off they're able to have something to hang. And I actually that's good. All right, getting ready to take it off. I can turn it over and <clears throat> where it went in behind, I can snip those or if I can, I'll just push them off the, um, I guess I'm gonna have to snip them. The person who worked this one did a good job. They're pretty tight. not to snip them you can for sure and then you need to tie them to secure them but I'm hoping that maybe I can leave them as a loop okay, so I'm making sure that I have that up there I'm able to one last one that's still caught so now that I can lift it I'm going to make sure that it stays on this knitting needle and lift it so that it can come out of those other loops. If I turn it this way, you can see what I'm doing. And I'm just gently pulling 
can see this wharf was well, uh, well anchored and once So there are some pieces that I need to weave back in if you don't want those ends. I guess I can decide which is the front and which is the back. Um, if I have a preference as to the way the colors have gone, the way the textures have gone, I'm thinking this is maybe more also. probably like to twist these and put them on a loop, perhaps even tie a knot in them, similar to what has been done with this one in terms of putting it on the dowel. Um, this one is has been tied onto a branch found outside and you can see how it's just been twisted and tied on. This one is has been done with a dowel. And so those are, those are the things that I will need to do. Um, and I can just simply do it by taking in a section at a time, tying them together. It will keep them a little bit um, more secure in the weaving. Again, I come to these pieces at the side. Do they add to what I'm looking for? Or do I want to um, perhaps leave them in? I think in some cases I like this part going down the side. And so I will simply tie them in a way that they are secure. The weaving that has been completed is secure. This one needs to be part of that. not what I want, so I will be redoing that one. Okay. Here's one that needs to be woven in, and I can, if I have a crochet hook or if I have, um, I did have a needle, I can just make sure that I am tucking that in out of the way and clipping it off. So I just look for a place where I can weave it in and back out. And I can take my scissors and very carefully cut it close to, but making sure that I don't cut any of those other important pieces so that it's out of the way. There's one more that probably needs to be woven in. Let me just do that one quickly. Often you're trying to follow the pathway of um, going in, whether it's um, following the pathway of under and over of a previous row. So it doesn't actually unwind, unravel that particular color, but secures it instead in a way that doesn't disturb the overall effect. And again, I can cut close to, but not cut the fabric. Okay, I'm 
do have a dowel, but it's too long. So if I don't have a, a branch, I will uh, look to cutting this dowel a little shorter. I can twist these. And this bottom rod is much longer than I would want it to be. Um, so it's a work in progress. Now I've just secured those side pieces um, in a decorative way. I may choose to trim them uh, once I figure out sort of the overall effect that I'm looking for. Um, I may choose to trim them so that they're more even and we'll see what it looks like once it's hanging because that will be different. So again, this has been a little bit of a work in progress, um, but an example of perhaps how you might experiment and explore with weaving using a small loom. You can make something that is um, quite carefully woven and flat and use it in your home. You can use something that is equally carefully woven. This is tabby weave in and out, but by using different colors has created uh, different shapes and the illusion of perhaps trees, perhaps a forest. Um, and this one has a lot more texture um, and can take. So, but they were all made using uh, the cardboard looms like this. So give it a try and uh, please share with us when you have something that you, either a question or share with us what you have created. We'd love to see it.